the launch of the um, exporter barometer survey and roundtable discussion um, hosted uh, by USAID on, and the partnership on the partner project in collaboration with uh, the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. It's a pleasure to um, host this event and uh, launch this um, tool, which we hope for the private sector will be uh, one which will be enriching and also provide a lot of exporter insights going forward on, on different areas. And as we go through the program today, uh, we will um, uh, understand some of uh, the findings as well as uh, to understand how this survey could be uh, better developed. Uh, today's discussion uh, will feature numerous speakers, and we will uh, conclude with a uh, enriching panel discussion. Um, we will hear from uh, speakers from the Salon Chamber, uh, from USAID, uh, from a partner uh, a partner activity as well, as well as the uh, virtual launch of the event, followed by the roundtable uh, discussion. Uh, for any questions that you may have during the session, uh, please send it through the Q&A option that is uh, there um, on your Zoom uh, webinar um, um, option, and we will take those questions uh, towards the end as well. Uh, so let me now, um, and, and we're streaming live also on Facebook for, uh, for the viewers on, on the Salon Chamber of Commerce Facebook page as well. Uh, let me now uh, invite uh, Mr. Manjula De Silva, the CEO and Secretary General of the Salon Chamber of Commerce to uh, deliver uh, some welcome remarks. Good morning. Uh, can, can you hear me, Siran? Yes, Manjula, go ahead. Uh, Mrs. Suresh Dimel, uh, Chairman of the EDB. Uh, Ms. Michelle Kosielski, Director, Economic Growth Office of the USAID, uh, Sri Lanka and Maldives. Mr. Malit Gunasekara, Chief of Party, USAID Supported Partner Activity. Panelists joining the roundtable discussion uh, and participants. Uh, let me extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the launch of the Export Barometer Survey and roundtable discussion, which is being organized by the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce together with the USAID supported partner project. The Export uh, Barometer Survey is a biannual survey. Uh, which is being implemented with the main purpose of gaining and sharing an insight on exporters. Uh, it will provide an under understanding of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the transition uh, of the economy to a new normal, uh, particularly focusing on how it impacts the export trade. Uh, it will also uh, signal changes uh, that are expected to take place uh, in the export trade and will act as a forward-looking indicator. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, it will help to understand the pulse of the exporter community, uh, which is very important uh, at a time when uh, promoting exports uh, has become the need of the hour, uh, particularly uh, to accelerate the pace of uh, the post-pandemic recovery and also to help address uh, the foreign exchange crisis we are currently grappling with. Uh, and these findings will certainly help the Ceylon Chamber uh, in its policy advocacy efforts. Uh, and the Ceylon Chamber on its part will work very closely with the government and in particular with the EDB uh, who is represented today by its chairman, uh, other uh, board agencies, uh, and all other institutions which are uh, dealing with the subject of export development uh, to facilitate exports. And this survey uh, will definitely go a long way uh, to contribute uh, towards these efforts. And uh, today, uh, we will be releasing the first report based on the first survey under this series uh, that was carried out in August. And I must congratulate the chamber and the partner teams for uh, completing this task uh, speedily, uh, the evaluation process, and being able to release the report within a very short period of time. Uh, and the CCC and the USAID supported 
partner activity are engaged in a number of collaborations. So this is just one of them. Uh, and another example would be uh, the training that is being conducted for the development officers of the EDB, uh, which commenced uh, uh, some time back, a couple of months ago. And already I'm happy to say uh, that we conducted two sessions uh, in Colombo and uh, one in Kurunagala, and the other one is currently in progress in Gaul. Uh, so that is another initiative which actually hopes to uh, impart knowledge on export facilitation uh, to the entire network of development officers of the EDB who are spread out uh, throughout the country. And uh, so likewise, I believe this initiative will also be uh, another uh, excellent example of collaborative activity uh, between uh, the partner project and the Ceylon Chamber. Uh, so in conclusion, I would like to thank uh, all the exporters who completed the survey, uh, all the panelists who are here uh, joining the roundtable discussion, and I wish uh, today's event all success. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Manjula, for those uh, welcome remarks, and I think setting the tone uh, for uh, today's launch and, and the discussion as well. Um, let me now uh, warmly invite uh, Michelle Kwasiewski, who is the Director of the Economic Growth Office of USAID, Sri Lanka and Maldives, uh, to deliver some brief remarks. Uh, Michelle, over to you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Kaszczelski. I am the Economic Growth Director at the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID for short, overseeing both Sri Lanka and Maldives, and I'm delighted to be part of this forum today. Uh, as a longstanding development partner supporting Sri Lanka and its people, USAID has provided development and humanitarian assistance to Sri Lanka for more than six decades. Our current goal is to support Sri Lanka to achieve sustained and inclusive economic growth so the country can reach advanced economy status. To this end, USAID partners with Sri Lanka's government and private sector, as well as local and international organizations, think tanks and academia to increase the island's international economic competitiveness. Many of our activities support the economy's recovery and growth, including our partner project, which aims to accelerate results in trade, national expenditure, and revenue. The US is the single largest export destination for Sri Lankan products. It accounts for almost 3 billion a year, which is almost one quarter of Sri Lanka's annual exports. From apparel to rubber, gemstones to tea and spices, the relationship is mutually beneficial. But we also know the relationship could grow and become more complex. But the diversification and sustained growth of the export sector is crucial for the economic recovery or the economic growth of any country. As such, USAID's partner project works with public and private sector stakeholders to support export growth and help Sri Lankan enterprises excel in international trade. For instance, together with the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, Partner helps to train more than 300 expert development, office, development officers of the Export Development Board so they can better support local, small, and medium enterprises to export their goods to overseas markets and increase their incomes. Partner also developed the Export Business Recovery Support Service concept, or EXPRESS, to provide specialized mentoring to exporter SMEs on financial management, organizational development, and human resource development. Not only will this improve operations, but ideally it will increase the growth of women-led businesses. And understanding the business landscape is essential to supporting a faster recovery for exports during the pandemic. That's why our partner project in collaboration with the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce has designed and conducted surveys to understand the trade and workforce related trends of large export firms and small and medium enterprises, including firms owned and or led by women. The survey presented today, the Export Barometer Survey, reflects the sentiments of more than 120 Sri Lankan exporters. It is the first in a series of biannual surveys that we hope will provide Sri Lankan policymakers with valuable insights to, in, to support economic, to support export growth, excuse me. It captures the impact of COVID-19 
and the economic transition to a new post-pandemic setting, including changes in export trade and the need of exporters. All businesses around the world are experiencing significant challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Overcoming these challenges are, are especially essential to exporters given the crucial role they play in, in, de, in the development journey. I found it encouraging that 50% of the surveyed, films, surveyed firms actually increased export revenue during the survey period, and 75% found new export opportunities. The vast majority of firms, 85%, didn't undertake any labor cost reduction measures during the survey period. And around a third of the firms intend to employ more workers during the next six months. This reveals the resilience of Sri Lanka's private sector exporters and is heartening to witness such strong growth momentum. USAID is proud to invest in initiatives such as this, for we believe that sustained inclusive and resilient economic growth is central in our partnership with countries like Sri Lanka to raise standards of living of all citizens in pursuit of President Biden's Build Back Better World post-pandemic recovery. Insights from surveys such as this will be helpful to design evidence-based responses to support Sri Lankan exporters in their road to recovery and sustained growth. I thank all survey participants for their contributions to this initiative and the panelists for participating in the roundtable and I look forward to a robust discussion on the survey results. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle, uh, for those remarks and uh, providing perspectives of how this uh, program is, is amongst, uh, sitting with the other programs that the USAID is, is conducting under this project. Uh, thank you so much for your remarks. Uh, let me now um, invite uh, Malit Gunasekara, who is Chief of Party for USAID Partner Activity, uh, to provide his uh, initial remarks. Thank you, Shiran. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Malit Gunasekara. I'm the chief of party of the Partner Project. I would like to welcome you all to this event on behalf of the Partner Team. Uh, Partner stands for Partnership for Accelerating Results in Trade, National Expenditure, and Revenue. Uh, I, I will not go into many details. I think Manjula, as well as Michelle, uh, mentioned a lot of uh, efforts that we are making, uh, in, especially in the trade area, uh, since we start commenced the project. Our project is a $19 million project. It's five years. We are uh, on the third year of operations, funded by USAID, implemented by Deloitte Consulting US, with partnership with uh, Ceylon Chamber of Commerce and Deloitte India. Uh, partner supports. Sri Lanka to facilitate trade and improve the collection and use of public financial resources. The project is organized along two thematic areas. Objective one focuses on the government to improve government efficiency and service delivery. Objective two aims to strengthen the enabling environment for trade and investment. Uh, we also work uh, extensively with the private sector also. Under the objective two, which is the trade and investment component of the project, we focus on increasing institutional capacities on trade, removing barriers for international trade, as well as improving capacity, sustainability of private sector associations, chambers of commerce, and civil society organization. Our goal is to make the private sector, especially MSMEs, regional businesses and women-led owned businesses to be more competitive, help them grow and attract more investments to Sri Lanka. Towards achieving this goal, we implemented a number of activities with Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, which were mentioned uh, by my uh, the speakers before me. And our implementing partner is the main implementing partner is the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. Today's event is organized by uh, CCC in support, with the support of the Partner Objective 2 team as part of an initiative called the Export Barometer Survey. Given the huge impact of COVID-19 outbreak on the Sri Lankan economy, we felt that it is important to understand challenges faced 
by the export businesses and how the businesses are transitioning into the new normal. Also the type of frequent changes in the trading environment, as well as the need and support requirements of exporters in their road to recovery and growth. We will be carrying out this survey on a biannual basis. And the first survey of the barometer series was implemented in August, 2019. The objectives of today's session are to release the first survey report of the export barometer series, share the findings of the survey that most of you took part in, thank you very much for that, and provide a platform to discuss and identify actionable outcomes to facilitate exports in Sri Lanka. On a final note, I would like to thank the CCC team who worked really hard uh, to get this survey out. The partner team, especially Pubudini, Janaka and Hasita, who worked uh, to ensure that we have this event and also all the reports in place and conducting also the survey and organizing this session. Uh, I also wish to thank all the speakers, panelists for their participation and contributions. And to all of you for taking part in the survey and also joining this discussion today. I also wish to thank USAID for enabling the work we do because of their strong commitment to improve the competitiveness of Sri Lanka's private sector. Thank you and wish you a productive session. Thanks. Thank you, Malik, um, for those remarks. And with that, we will uh, get into what is, I think, probably the most debated part of uh, today's webinar, which is to understand the findings, uh, which uh, I will uh, be doing in a brief presentation. And then we will um, have the launch of the report, uh, which will be live on, on our Trade Watch, um, uh, on our Trade Watch uh, website as well. Uh, so if I go into the report, hope everyone can see my screen. Um, I think as, as, as a lot of the speakers uh, prior to me has highlighted, um, uh, what exactly is the Export Barometer Survey Series? It is a biannual survey series really to, uh, with, with several aims, but really to understand the pulse of the exporter uh, understand uh, what are the key trends, uh, what are the things that are challenges, what are some of the opportunities, and really aid uh, policymakers in facilitating uh, the export uh, growth and momentum that the country uh, desires. Uh, right now, uh, it, is, uh, it is about understanding the impact of COVID-19 and, and the transition, um, and really what are some of the support areas, specific support areas that the exporters uh, really require. Uh, in, in August, uh, the team formulated um, uh, a detailed questionnaire really covering four main sections. Um, we, we understood the, the exporter background, uh, the details which we'll get into, uh, the export performance changes, what happened in the first half of 2021 um, compared to the period before. Um, then we understood what are some of the emerging opportunities, what are some of the facilitation measures. And then finally, the survey concluded to uh, with with the outlook for the next six months uh, from, uh, from August onwards. Um, and uh, the survey received uh, over 120 uh, responses and uh, we will get into those uh, breakdown as well. Um, if, you look at, um, if you look at the, um, uh, the firm type and the type of employees, uh, the survey predominantly saw um, SMEs. So we saw 64% of the firms coming uh, respondents coming from the SMEs, um, and close to about 40% had between uh, 51 to 300 uh, employees. 24% um, of the firms were uh, women-owned or, or female-led-owned businesses uh, that took part in the survey. Uh, the exporter survey did have uh, almost two-thirds coming from the Western province, um, but it did see um, uh, responses from other parts of and other districts uh, within uh, Sri Lanka as, as well. Um, the survey is a reflection, uh, about close to 80% of a reflection of the performance of, of the export of goods. Uh, services uh, had close to uh, 11 to 15% uh, coming in 
And a lot of the survey responses that we see came from uh, C-suite level or senior level, level manager um, uh, respondents. Uh, so what are the key insights? We've organized it in terms of seven key insights. So it's very easy uh, to understand from this presentation, but you will see in the, in the detailed report, uh, some of these um, insights elaborated further. Um, so the first key insight was uh, similar to the overall macro trend that we saw in the first half of 2021 in export performance. Uh, we, uh, the survey respondents, the exporter firms did highlight uh, that they had seen um, a significant increase in export revenue. Uh, so 50% of them did see export um, uh, an increase in export revenue in the first half of 2021 compared to uh, the previous period before it. Um, and uh, close to two thirds of, of these firms saw an increase between zero to 20 uh, percent uh, in terms of export revenue growth. Um, and in terms of uh, the breakdown of uh, firms, uh, we can see that um, uh, actually a lot of the growth in terms of revenue uh, came in uh, through uh, the SME uh, firms as well. However, while there was a significant revenue growth, uh, we did see uh, uh, slight under capac uh, capacity not being utilized fully. And we only saw 61% of the firms really having capacity between 61 to 100%. Uh, so this signals that there is a significant room or capacity to be utilized uh, by these firms to generate more revenue. And I think that's indicated by the outlook uh, for, um, for capacity growth in the next six months as well. Um, some of the key challenges, uh, the expert highlighted numerous challenges that they faced uh, during the period as well. Uh, but um, two key challenges were in terms of sourcing inputs and in terms of the rising cost of transport and logistics. Uh, so sourcing imports were driven uh, a lot by the increase in either the price of the input or the shortage of certain um, uh, certain raw materials or service input, both domestically as well as uh, internationally as well. And we did see, um, as we've seen with a lot of the global uh, shipping industries going up, uh, the exporters also um, uh, expressing the view that they'd seen an alarming increase, uh, 84 to 87% increase, both in freight cost and shipping cost. Um, as well during the period. Um, in, in terms of labor, uh, there was a great deal of uh, positivity. Uh, more firms uh, were, were, retaining, um, were retaining their workforce um, and the expectation is to continue uh, to uh, retain this workforce while really looking at um, uh, incre increasing, not, not really cut, cutting back on uh, training, but really increasing on items like uh, training as well. And even certain firms looking at uh, had seen an increase in recruitment as well. So these were um, uh, good, good indicators in terms of the labor uh, and employment uh, dynamics within these exporter firms. On the digital aspect as well. Um, so this is an area that we'll be looking to uh, explore further in, in future surveys as well. But as a baseline, um, we, we understand that two thirds of firms are really using online channels to generate sales. Uh, and and uh, while um, uh, this is only generating, um, not generating a lot of the revenue, it's still uh, an avenue for, for growth. And we're really seeing uh, social media being the preferred choice uh, amongst, uh, amongst the exporters in terms of the key channel uh, being used. And uh, this is even higher uh, in female owned or led businesses uh, compared to uh, large firms uh, as well. Uh, in terms of the opportunities, we are um, um, most, most firms, close to 75% of the firms had found new opportunities during the first half of the year. Um, a lot of those opportunities were found by the SMEs. Uh, and I think um, the, the, range, the types of opportunities were either, you know, exporting the, the existing product to new markets or um, exporting uh, new, new products and services to uh, with their same existing market as well. While some, some uh, exporters uh, did see new products and new services going to uh, new export markets as well, while only a, a little, um, a few uh, saw a shift towards selling in the domestic uh, market as well. Um, however, the exporters highlighted the real need to, uh, 
be facilitated further to drive competitiveness given um, given the need for exports to be globally competitive. Uh, so it was a unanimous close to 90% of the firms said that they needed uh, facilitation from government. A lot of these revolved around uh, market access support, um, improving efficiencies in, in regulatory processes. This was a key concern uh, that we got from exporters, not only to this specific question, but also in, in subsequent comments. Um, tax, tax relief was also highlighted as well as, I think, given the challenges related to shipping and logistics assistance in managing uh, some of these challenges as well. Um, not only the, the, uh, the role of the government agencies, but also the role of uh, chambers uh, like, like the Ceylon Chamber and other um, uh, projects, uh, uh, donors to projects, what can they do to facilitate exports? And this was where similar to, um, to government facilitation, there were common areas in terms of uh, accessing new markets, helping them find new buyers, um, intervening in particular on customs related issues, um, helping them with training programs for SME exporters, and also uh, promoting some of the uh, subsectors or sub industries uh, that are required to promote uh, the, the main uh, the main uh, trust industries as well. So um, those are some of the uh, key facilitation measures required that was pointed out by exporters as well. And finally, in terms of the outlook, um, it seemed the exporters were were more confident in terms of the outlook for business uh, than they were in terms of their view on the economy. Um, so a lot of the firms, are close to half, expected a contraction of the economy. Uh, but uh, when you look at um, the, the expectation in terms of export growth, uh, close to about 48% expected moderate or high growth um, uh, compared to only 28%, which expected a moderate or severe contraction. So clearly the outlook for export growth is, um, is, is, is positive. Uh, and in terms of where this growth is going to come from, um, it was noteworthy to see that exporters are looking at new markets. So 54% of firms are looking at one to two new markets. 22% uh, of the firms are looking at three to five new markets and 10% are looking at more than five markets. And when we look at some of the uh, top 10 uh, to 15 uh, markets that exporters are looking at, we can see a few uh, non-traditional um, markets that exporters are willing to explore. Of course, markets like Europe and, and the US, which are uh, in the top two to three um, are, are continued uh, are markets that exporters are willing to um, explore further as well. Um, so those are the insights in terms of um, uh, the seven key insights. And um, in terms of uh, where you can find the report, uh, it, is, it is now live on uh, Salon Chambers Trade Watch, which is also another partner activity under, the, under this project as well. Uh, you can simply find it on, on Trade Watch. If you click, um, if you go to chamber.lk slash Trade Watch, you'll find the report um, uh, as the first update on, on, on the screen. And the report, the full report can be accessed um, uh, and is live now. Um, so with that, let me um, uh, now invite uh, the EDB chairman, uh, Mr. Suresh Dimel, to uh, provide his views uh, with the launch of this report, his remarks um, and, and, and perspectives, which will also, I think, set the context uh, for our panel discussion, which will come after this as well. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. I am privileged uh, to be leading the EDB at a time when the USAID and Ceylon Chamber of Commerce have come together to, on a timely initiative that uh, as such, uh, such as the part the program. Yesterday I participated in uh, of uh, development of, of EDB's development officers in the South. And uh, I'm excited that uh, that regional development and SME development has all become a top priority now in expanding exports uh, in Sri Lanka. And uh, as uh, most of you know, I have been involved with the regional chambers of commerce for since the inception of, of the chambers. 
and I've been closely uh, working with Ceylon Chamber to build capacity of our regional chambers. And now through the EDB and through our joint efforts, I'm sure that we can do some miraculous things. After this COVID pandemic, I think it is mandatory that we all collaborate and we have so much to share and we will need to share so much because the gap between the regions and Colombo, I think is widened after this, uh, these two years or one and a half years of uh, pandemic. And the future is also uncertain. And I think that uh, Sri Lankan business, especially in the regions is not as agile as maybe um, the businesses in, in Colombo. So they will need a lot of assistance. Um, on another note, uh, the EDB's main responsibilities are to be a facilitator, a promoter, a knowledge provider, a monitor, and a policy advisor. Now, if we look at the, uh, this uh, barometer for exports, I think there is not, nothing more important for all those five functions uh, of the EDB. And this is very timely and, and I think has not been done before quite like this. And I'm very happy to hear that you will be doing it biannually. And I look forward to, I'm sure it is going to be of immense uh, use for EDB and our officers as because these are the kinds of questions that even I get asked several times a day by, by not only exporters, but also the policy makers. So this will be extremely useful uh, as we move forward also in discovering this uncertain time that, that you know, we sometimes policymakers in a, in, a, in a country with so much diversity, uh, we have the regional diversity, we have the biodiversity, we have all this. Uh, it is very difficult for a policymaker to, to make policy that, that is good for everyone because the situation in the north is different from the east, is different from the southwest and the center. So uh, sometimes uh, may, many policies are made by perceptions without good hard data. And I think we need to start thinking. I don't think the data is going to be uh, perfect when we get it from questionnaires, but I think we can look at the context and understand what people's aspirations are. And I think that is very key for us to make policy because then we can, we can advise the government. I mean, EDB, one of our responsibilities is to be the policy advisor. And when we, have, we will have more confidence in, in uh, forwarding uh, policy uh, revisions or, or new policies that need to be uh, identified. Uh, we can discuss that very confidently with the government with uh, data like this. So I commend the, uh, the USAID and CCC for this initiative, and I look forward to our roundtable discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh, um, for those remarks. Um, next, we will head into the roundtable discussion. Um, and before we start off, uh, if there's any questions on the report or uh, for the panelists, please send it through the, uh, the Q&A uh, function on, on Zoom, and we will pick it up uh, as the roundtable continues. Um, so please uh, send them in as well. And we've dropped the link on the chat box to the report as well. So that, that can be accessed by everyone now. Um, so let me now warmly invite um, our roundtable uh, panelists uh, for uh, for the forum uh, for the for the discussion, uh, we have uh, Shia Vikramasinghe, who is the group uh, managing director of uh, Ceylon Biscuits Limited. We have uh, Johan Lawrence, who is the past vice chairman and current uh, exco member of the Joint Apparel Association Forum. Uh, we have Tala Al Shams, who is the chairman of the Exporters Association of Sri Lanka. Uh, we have Ashik Emali, who is the vice chairperson at Slash.com. Um, and um, we have Charindi Ranasinghe, who is the deputy chairperson at SIA Group of Companies. Uh, so we've invited a wide range of uh, exporters, both on the good sides, both on the services side, those who are leading 
associations, uh, the respective associations to get a more holistic uh, view and perspective. Uh, so welcome, welcome to you all and thank you for accepting our invite as well at this point. Um, so let me um, initially, so we'll have four rounds of, of uh, discussion in this round table uh, in the next um, 45 minutes or so. In the first round, we will understand uh, or get your initial reactions to the survey findings that was presented, your comments. Um, then we will get into uh, the specific challenges faced by exports. Some of these could be the challenges which was highlighted in the report. Some of them could be some of the current challenges. Uh, then we will move into uh, understanding the emerging opportunities uh, as well. And then the last round will be uh, in terms of understanding the outlook um, that was presented uh, today as well, but outlook from your perspective and maybe suggestions as well in terms of what um, what this uh, export barometer could focus on going forward, given uh, its purpose is to have it do it have it uh, run biannually as well. Um, so maybe let me first uh, invite um, Johan maybe to give your initial remarks, and then maybe we can have Shia uh, following after that. Sure, thank you, Shiran. Uh, thank you for asking us to be on this panel. Um, I think that the survey is really good. I think it's been good that you've had a reasonably good number of responses across the patch. Um, in, the, in the world we're in today, where things are changing so rapidly, I think it's absolutely crucial to keep an eye on this uh, because things that are important today, six months down the road, you know, the, the whole ball has changed and people look at it differently. So I think for, you know, for example, one of our key insights, you know, about capacity at, you know, six months ago when we did the survey, I think we were saying people had, capacity available and certainly from an apparel point of view, if you look at it today, now what we've said at that time, which was we were expecting things to pick up, it's changed and capacity is full. So that's just an example of how this, how the situation is dynamic, how it's changing. Um, but I think the, the report's exceedingly useful. Um, I think it helps us to focus um, on the areas that we know are required for growth across the sector. And this is not just apparel, but across the, the export forum. Um, again, I think in today's context, particularly with foreign exchange challenges and so on, it's going to be important to make sure that we keep a pulse on what's going on so that we can also, you know, uh, use our officers for lobbying and things like that to make sure that we get um, the right messages being pushed through and, and action taken in the right area. So, yeah, um, looking forward to the discussion, but yeah, absolutely. Um, Happy to be here, and I think it's a really good start that, that the team done in pulling this together. Thanks. Thanks, Johan. Um, Shia, if I can get your initial remarks, and then maybe um, we can get Talal and then uh, Charlie and Ashik after that. Thank you, Shiran. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, the, I, I think doing this kind of survey is important. It would put focus um, into our exports, which I think, you know, Sri Lanka, is uniquely positioned to do many things, but also because of its size, um, we also have a lot of challenges. And I hope if you're doing this survey, we would be able to um, possibly narrow down the categories a little bit more also in the future. So we, we could actually see progress um, in some of the areas. So if I were to just touch upon the, the food um, exports, you know, globally, the demand for food grew. Um, and because there was such supply chain disruptions, um, while there was growth and while there was demand growth, a um, lot of challenges, you, you know, globally and, and Sri Lanka was no different. And, uh, you know, your survey showed that many companies, um, you know, despite, you know, not being able to travel and meet buyers, we, you know, some companies saw um, revenue growth, but, um, with that, it's also true, it's the larger companies, I believe, that were able to sustain their exports as smaller companies faced a lot of challenges in supply chain um, right across. So I think there are a lot of interesting things that come out of the, the report. And um, if we can form, you know, you know collectively, the, the different associations use this kind of feedback to proactively um, look at the challenges that, that need to be addressed. And there are many, um, I, I'm sure in, in every sector, I, I think it would be a great start. 
Thank you. Thanks, Shia. Um, uh, Talat, if you can have your initial remarks. Hi, uh, hi, Shiran. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much uh, to the CCC and USAID for putting this report together. Um, you know, it's 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 very important that we have information um, as an association when we uh, speak to government officials or the EDB or whoever it is. And um, having a report like this come out every six months, I think, is is a very good thing. Um, also, I'm very uh, was very happy to note that 75% of the firms actually found new export opportunities uh, during this during this. Uh, challenging period. Um, and uh, there's lots more that uh, that was covered in the report that we could uh, go through uh, in the next three sessions. Thank you, uh, Shiran. Thanks. Thanks, Tala. Charindi. Hi, Shiran. Thanks for having me on this panel. Thank you, Ceylon Chamber of Commerce and USA for completing this survey. Um, I think as the speakers before mentioned, um, data and information is so important, so vital when, when it comes to making policy decisions. Um, this survey indeed shows uh, the impact of the pandemic and also the recovery from it. Uh, it's, it's very delightful to see that there's a lot of activity in terms of partnerships and JVs, which is always signal, which is always a good signal. It uh, would be nice to see where the, in which industries this uh, activity is, just to get an indication of where the investor interest is at. Um, the outlook definitely seems positive, as Tala said, um, there's new markets opening up, um, Australia, Canada, China, this is all very positive to see. Um, I was a little bit concerned to see and would like to know why um, women are facing uh, difficulties in finding funds for operational cash flow. Um, maybe this is something for the banks to have a look at. Um, I think it's my responsibility to make sure that it's highlighted in a panel like this. Um, so, but the challenges faced by exporters are way heavy, uh, and this can't be forgotten. And I think we'll be speaking about it more later on in this panel discussion. Um, thanks again for having me, Sharon. Thanks, Sharon. Hi, Ash. Uh, we can have your initial remarks. Hi, uh, good morning to everyone, and uh, congratulations to the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, uh, the USAID. Uh, Export Development Board in uh, getting this out in a very short time. Uh, and uh, I think it's being doing this every six months is a good sense of, uh, you know, keeping a tab on how things are moving as they are rapidly changing uh, to uh, Johan's point as well. Uh, I'm not sure whether this survey has uh, taken into account the, the software sector that uh, and the BPM sector that I represent. Uh, they covered uh, we need to we need to look at the data and see um, having said that I mean our, our sector is uh, poised to achieve about 1.7 billion dollars of exports uh, uh, by 2021 and uh, the, the fact is that because we don't move goods uh, through hard channels like the customs and uh, 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 various uh, other means, uh, and everything is delivered on the internet. Uh, there is a, a lack of trade statistics, so to speak, uh, and most of it is uh, uh, done through the survey mechanisms by the central bank, Department of uh, Census Statistics, and including us, LASCOM runs its own survey as well. Uh, so, um, would like to see how how well we get represented uh, going forward, uh, and and some of the uh, factors that uh, really affect our, our, our sector also uh, uh, being highlighted uh, in, in the more detailed areas. But overall, I think it's a very good effort and data is uh, very critical. Uh, and every six months is a, a good uh, time interval to uh, do uh, checks on this. Thanks, Ashik. Um, so I think we the survey was predominantly, um, I think uh, if you look at it, close to 80% covering goods, uh, but we did have quite a, um, uh, maybe about 15 to 20% services and within that uh, quite a few uh, Ashik from uh, the services side, from the ITBPM side and, and within your membership as well. But I think that's an area that uh, that the survey can evolve 
to really capture more uh, insights from uh, from at, at a sectoral level even and, and covering IP BPM. So that's that's a good point to note. I think for us uh, internally as we develop this um, uh, this parameter out as well. Uh, so thanks uh, for those insights that we have uh, got initially. Um, uh, let me just move to the second um, second aspect of our discussion and uh, please to all the participants do send in uh, your questions as well we can we can take them up as we go on um, in terms of the challenges really faced by uh, the exporters um, you could maybe refer to some of the challenges that were expressed in the report um, are there still challenges that you all are facing maybe there's more and importantly if maybe you could outline um, how your company your firm or your association is really looking to tackle some of these challenges. And I think that takeaway might be very useful uh, for the uh, participants uh, joined in as well. And, um, and Suresh, if, if you're still on as well, you could respond uh, potentially at the end of this round as well. You want, you want to go first and then maybe we can. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so I think in terms of the challenges, obviously the, yeah, the, the challenge of capacity doesn't exist anymore for Para, as I mentioned, because we've now uh, the other, come out the other side of that, where the challenge is actually getting capacity, obviously. In a post-COVID scenario, there has been a number of people who've withdrawn from the workforce and actually try to get people back into work is, um, is, is, is probably one of the biggest challenges right now. Um, I think the challenge about shipping costs um, frequency still remains that that situation is really not getting any better. I know there's been a number of uh, efforts made to try to uh, to resolve this. And this is from two perspectives, both in terms of the cost, in terms of cost of freight, and also in terms of saving opportunities. And so I'm now conscious that this is obviously part of a much bigger global problem. Um, but we need to make sure that everybody within the country is working to a solution to this and not palming it off on the basis that you know it's a global issue and we can't do anything. There are things that we can do. So I think that that one still remains. Um, I, I think the, the one about the B2B and B2C issue is also uh, still relevant. I think one of the, the issues, I mean, from a digital transformation point of view where we struggle with is, is on the B2C. Um, obviously for smaller companies who have the smaller independent brands, the B2C model that, that works. I'm not so sure how much of it works from the export side, um, but you know I think there are some challenges that we have on this particularly. For example, one of the ones we've been pushing for a little while is this issues of things like PayPal, where we, you know we're not able to you know we can in, ironically we can use PayPal to import something, but you know we can't export something using it. So I think there are some challenges in the structure of our setups that we operate in that are going to be restricting because I think the B2C model is coming and it, it's as we see it's starting out and you know some of the smaller in, in, um, independent brands and so on but I think that you know at some point that's going to start coming so I think that one is still going to be there so I think those are really our main thing I think our, our, our big challenge I think and obviously the one that's not covered in this because it's sort of maybe that's come up since is the is, is issues in terms of you know obviously the foreign exchange issue and how that impacts on everybody here. Um, but yeah, I think main, mainly um, the big one, I think is the shipping, the shipping one. And I think that's something which all exporters face and all importers face as well. So uh, yeah, I think that's where we stand at the moment, Shira. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks, Johan. Uh, Talal, from, from the exporter membership um, that you represent, um, do some of these challenges Johan mentioned resonate or are the fresh challenges how are you all as an association um, looking to overcome it? Um, absolutely, Shiran. I mean, uh, the biggest challenge right now is the is the freight uh, and the shipping uh, matter, uh, where basically freight rates are sky high, and also we don't have enough vessels calling in Colombo to carry our cargo out, right? Uh, apart from that, uh, there's also certain industries that have uh, uh, issues, like, um, uh, for example, the seafood industry where they're having issues where they can't get packing material um, uh, for, for, for their exports. Um, above that, uh, you, have the, you have the other issues where, you know, there's no, uh, some of the input material is not 
available due to um, you know the currency crisis and stuff like that, like Johan said. Um, yeah, that's those are the main issues at the at the moment, uh, and uh, we need to work with the government, work with the EDB, and find solutions for our membership to to try and overcome these problems. Thanks, Salal. Uh, Charindi, from your perspective, uh, I know um, you do export a lot of agricultural and and vegetable and fruit related items, but also I think you work with uh, SME exporters as well. Um, how are the SMEs uh, in particular dealing with some of these uh, uh, challenges that's being brought out, or there are even more different fresh challenges for SME exporters? I think, um, Shriyan, so yes, you're right. We do export a lot of uh, FNV, but I'm also the vice chair of the Lanka Fruits and Vegetables Produce Processors, Producers and Exporters Association. So I'd like to bring in an industry perspective to your question, um, Shiran. Uh, the questions for our, the challenges for our industries is beyond uh, beyond large at this point. It's a very polarizing sector. I think today, yesterday on the news, you would have heard plenty about the fertilizer issue. Um, it's 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 a burning issue for our industry, our sector at this point. So I'd like to divide my, the challenges into country specific challenges, global challenges, and hybrid challenges, which is a hybrid of both those. So country specific is obviously uh, policy uncertainty. Um, <laughs> Agriculture is, is a, is a long-term investment. A lot of our members in the association have invested heavily in the sector, uh, whether it be pr uh, for processing, producing, or exporting, we have all been invested heavily. It's a, it's a long game, so government policy changes overnight hurts us the most. Um, there are not just local companies, but also multinational companies who are thinking of IRRs of over four to five years. Um, so, it's, it's been difficult for all these companies. Um, we have seen low grade products being smuggled into Sri Lanka from India. And this includes things like wood preservatives being used on agricultural products. Um, the prices are soaring. Uh, Sri Lankan exports are becoming un uncompetitive whether, it's your, whether you're value adding or otherwise or exporting fresh. Um, India is now taking on the Maldivian market um, and also the Middle Eastern market. Um, and so these challenges are being amplified the longer we take to resolve these issues. Um, and it's also hurting the next generation, generation which is you and I, Shiran. Um, a quick example is projects like the Agriculture Sector Modernization Project, which is a $125 million uh, loan, of which we are paying interest at 2.5%. Um, when the government policy changes overnight, these projects become almost, um, you know, they just don't align. So the interest is being paid by our generation, whereas, you know, the government decisions are being made today. Um, so in terms of policy level support, we've looked, I mean, our association has been working so, so hard on trying to get um, answers for some of these questions. Even a couple of days ago, we met the, uh, we met a secretary of, uh, of a ministry, uh, yeah. And the instructions he gave us at that two days ago is no longer relevant today. So these are the challenges we are facing. Um, and also moving from the fertilizer issue, uh, we also have issues on land availability and commercial cultivation. Sri Lanka needs to focus our agricultural production on, um, on commercial cultivation, just so that um, for, to make it more export viable. We have no land bank available in Sri Lanka, so this is something we've um, told, uh, we've, we've, we've brought up in, in many forums as well. Um, we need to look at high yielding varieties, farming techniques um, to make our products more export competitive. In terms of global challenges, I think Talal and Yuhan both um, highlighted that freight is an issue. Our sector is heavily reliant on air freight as well. Um, so uh, some of our um, freight rates to, for example, the Dubai sector is still hasn't changed at all since the start of the pandemic, even though we are now seeing arrivals from uh, Dubai and to and from Dubai, uh, almost 70% of the flight capacity is full, but we haven't been able to benefit from it as, uh, as exporters. And the hybrid issues, again, Halal highlighted it, um, prices of raw materials have been skyrocketing. Um, they change uh, almost weekly. Um, and so that's been, that's been affecting our sector as well. I think that summarized uh, a few of the challenges, Shiran. Thank you. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Charlie. I think that was a uh, very useful context um, in terms of some of the very specific uh, challenges uh, your industry, your association is facing and some of the cross challenges as well, and then how you're overcoming them. And maybe we can um, uh, get some feedback also from uh, DDB chairman as to how uh, DDB is also facilitating some of these uh, challenges as well. Uh, if I quickly move to um, Shia, maybe on, on, uh, on some of the other challenges that you're facing both in terms of uh, uh, maybe more specifically on the confectionery industry and, exp and, and exports, since there's a lot of exports that you do to the region and even uh, beyond the region as well. Yeah, so I think Charindi um, gave a very good summary of, um, you know, the food industry. Uh, uh, one, one of the challenges um, which is ongoing during the pandemic is, is supply chain. Um, and I, it's actually there's like a double whammy now because the agriculture components um, are affected by the the, yo, the low yields at the moment because of the fertilizer issues, and imports are affected um, because of the currency issue. Um, it's it, it's it's uh, you know it again boils down to if we want to export as a country, we need to have policy that supports this because. We are competing on a glo global scale, and as um, she also said, you know, you're, you're, we are losing our edge um, because of this um, kind of, I, I would say, almost unnecessary intervention sometimes, which have a huge impact um, on exports. So if you look at confectionery um, industry specifically, you have a lot of imports. Um, so you know today without focusing on business a large part of you know ceo and the cfo's um, time is trying to secure dollars to import raw materials to keep supply chain um stable i i think um if we are really serious as a country to export we really need to understand the challenges and we need to work um Another one that I raised at many forums, I'll bring it here um, as a challenge, it's, it's again related to supply chain is that um, we have, you know, a single, like we have interdependent areas. For example, China talked about land. Um, our land is heavily underutilized. Uh, if you take um, other countries, which we have to compete with, they don't do monocrops anymore. So they do two and three crops. Um, in, in most instances. So the difficulty in Sri Lanka is that we have different ministries looking at different crops. Agriculture has to be looked at holistically and not only agriculture, um, the water availability, water resources, you know, it's all interconnected and we have to have one overriding vision for this. And all the, I mean, this is not a, it's not a new, new issue. Um, but uh, over the, the years, we've un been unable to really, I, I think, create a huge impact because of this. Another issue that I would touch on briefly, which is not on the top challenges, is, is, is also labor in this country. Um, it, we, Sri Lanka still um, is not mechanized to a large extent in many, many of the um, primary processing um, um, in primary processing of agriculture. It, it's still very manual and, and uh, done the way it was done for decades before. Um, so investment is needed, modernization is definitely needed. Um, but then again, some of these things are not addressed because of this, we don't have this one policy towards, um, you know, taking agriculture to the level it needs to be taken. I, I mean, I can go on, so I, I will stop there for now. Thanks, Shia. I think your last point in terms of the mechanization and going on the value addition side, I think was highlighted by some of the uh, exporters who required facilitation to maybe import some of these machinery, uh, some of these new tools to uh, kickstart some of these uh, uh, endeavors as well. So I think that's probably an area uh, for, for policy support and uh, by the chambers as well as maybe the uh, policymakers as well. Um, Ashik, in terms of um, I think services has, in particular, the ICT BPM industry has seen a lot of, um, um, has seen a wide scope, especially in the last 18 to 24 months. 
So I guess the challenges are a bit different to you where it's really coping up with the demand. Uh, is that the case or is there, is there more challenges that you feel are there? No, absolutely. I mean, uh, capacity is one of the biggest uh, challenge right now uh, due to multiple factors. Uh, before I get into that, uh, when the pandemic hit, the whole work model itself for our industry especially changed. Uh, we are almost 95% work from home uh, uh, kind of industry, which meant all our workers were at home connecting via the internet and, and delivering. So they brought, this brought about issues on bandwidth. Fortunately, we have a good, uh, a good deregulated telco uh, uh, in, uh, what do you call operators here, and they were able to uh, meet the challenges, but they did also have issues because it was just not our segment. It was the country as a whole moving more digital. That means school children were going into uh, digital, uh, university students, other business sectors. Uh, so there was a huge pressure on the telco infrastructure. And uh, this came to bear on our industry as well in terms of coverage, um, especially when you move out of, uh, you know, Colombo into suburbs and beyond Western province. They are, because of the lockdown, most workers, uh, actually 65% of our workforce is from uh, outside of Western province. So when they went back to hometowns because they didn't want to be, you know, in boarded facilities, etc., cetera, in, in Colombo, uh, you know, connectivity became an issue. Uh, but the telcos have done a, a magnificent uh, a job in ramping up uh, and were able to uh, very soon uh, keep up with the demand. Uh, but sadly, on the other side, the electricity uh, did not really improve. So there's a lot of, uh, even in Colombo suburbs, there are interruptions, regular interruptions, which means uh, people can't uh, do their work on a daily basis consistently. And this affects uh, productivity and uh, delivery to customers. Uh, so these are more uh, logistical challenges that we had in keeping the industry running because we are 95 percent work from home. Uh, beyond that, on the capacity side, which is kind of the elephant in the room for our industry, uh, because digital transformation not only in Sri Lanka uh, but all over the world uh, accelerated at a tremendous pace, that you know brought unprecedented demand for our industry uh, with the existing customers as well as from uh, new customers and new markets. Uh, so. Uh, this, in the initial phase when everyone thought that they would lose their jobs um, and our industry, you know, was able to bat on without actually, you know, uh, do, you know uh, uh, reduce their uh, the manpower or, or for that matter, even salary scales, etc. We, we never spoke about, you know, reducing salary or, uh, you know, paying them uh, lesser than what we, uh, during that period. Uh, in fact, salary scales were going consistently up. Uh, throughout that period. Uh, so initially, the first, I think, 12 months from last March 2020, that was OK. But then this whole new model has taken root. Uh, you know, and this has now brought work from anywhere, remote work, freelancing, all these into, uh, uh, into, into the fore. And now we see that uh, you know, our, you know, the increasing demand is creating a lot of lateral hires within the industry, but also foreign companies now hiring directly or giving work, uh, which has right, put a big pressure, especially in the mid-tier, uh, four to five year experience workforce, which is very important to our uh, service delivery. Add to that, I think um, some of the negative media uh, about the country crisis, et cetera, is also uh, creating a, a lot more uh, migration. Uh, especially to countries like uh, you know, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US, UK. Um, the skill migration is now going double digit for our, our industry. And, and especially in our industry, the, in those markets as well, there is huge demand for uh, qualified professionals. So we are losing that four years plus experienced people uh, in a big way. And, and that's going to become a major issue. So as an industry, we also have to evolve. We have to see now it's not just our workforce because remote work from anywhere means that we should be able to also leverage uh, other countries which have ample workforce. Um, how do we do that? So as an industry, we are creating a, a roadmap and a playbook for our companies to how to deal with this because this will impact our industry single most uh, as a big thing. Thanks, Ashik. I think some interesting um, and very specific challenges uh, which 
uh, we must continue to monitor to see whether they are more signs of long-term trends or more short-term uh, pandemic-related uh, issues that are cropping up. Uh, Talal, I see your hand is up. Maybe I can have 30 seconds for you, and then I'll have yes. uh, Chairman EDB. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sharan. I think uh, just to reiterate one point that uh, Charindri said about policy inconsistency, I think the, the biggest challenge we are facing right now is the fact that there's no private sector uh, participation in formulating policy. And uh, we need to see how we could, we could get more involved with, uh, with formulating policy. So just want to bring that up. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Suresh, if you have any response to uh, some of the challenges and then uh, some, any remarks at this point. Yeah. Well, I'll start with the last question uh, before I forget that, because that's uh, that's a key uh, uh, issue. Um, how do we frame policy um, so that the policymakers will understand um, what we are trying to get at? Uh, that's been the biggest challenge for me at the EDB also is to communicate the concerns of our exporters to the policymakers, and uh, you know the EDB has a, a council of ministers, export development council of ministers, which was uh, which is supposed to meet regularly to uh, understand and sort out issues of the export uh, sector. Now this is something we have. You know, we, we it was in our mandated in our act in 1979, and hasn't for many years uh, convened now. And and I think we have to have a have a proper agenda and and uh, proper issues uh, framed in a way that we can share at a meeting like that. And I'm working on on reconvening this uh, export. Development Council of Ministers. I think I think that's critical to uh, bring about uh, consistent policy. And I agree very much that there needs to be more stakeholder participation in policy making, and uh, that is a top priority for us. Now, um, on facilitating these uh, issues, uh, for example, the seafood exporters issue. Um, they came to us with uh, that problem and we uh, managed to connect them to the shippers. Uh, this, was a, this was a problem that was um, partly uh, solvable by the shippers. So um, currently, I think a lot of those exporters are are working with the shipping companies and sorting that problem out uh, in a proper way. So, you know, if, if I have a group of people who come and request uh, uh, something like that, I can I can facilitate and we have done a lot of that over the, the last few uh, months. Especially with the COVID, there have been lots of new issues that keep coming up and um, we facilitated a lot of those. We have now 14, 14 telephone numbers that people can call on the sectoral personally get involved in, in sorting out issues for, for our exporters. And I hope that we can um, continue to maintain uh, 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 that relationship and also our advisory committees. These are very critical. We have about 300 private sector people participating in 24 advisory committees at the at the EDB and they meet every every month and uh, then we you know uh, can understand and and I must tell you that looking at the barometer I I would uh, I, I, I'm going to have a half a day um, brainstorming this with with my staff because I think uh, this is very valuable. These are all concerns that we have discussed uh, uh, periodically. And I think, I think even for policymakers, 
when we present something, you know, framing that that policy uh, is very important because I think somewhere a place where we fall short is is framing this policy. Um, by that, what I mean is, you know, we we writing an article to the newspaper or, or putting it in social media or getting the opposition to uh, lobby for it or something like that is not really the the preferred way i think i think the way is to to help help policymakers believe that what we are saying is uh, is correct and i think that's where our associations chambers we all have to come together our, you know the government departments such as the edb we we must come together with the you know have closer collaboration in framing policy so uh, let's hope that uh, initiatives like this will uh, encourage that and and you know bring us on the same page, basically. So uh, thanks, yeah. thanks, Suresh, uh, and thanks for staying on and um, taking some of these questions that's coming up. Um, I think we have about ten to twelve minutes remaining in the roundtable, so let me quickly uh, get into the third and fourth areas. Uh, so if I can quickly get. Uh, the views of the panel, uh, maybe in 30 to 45 seconds in terms of, or, or let me say a minute, in terms of some of the emerging opportunities that you're seeing. Some of you already talked about uh, the, the inflows uh, and, and some of the uh, uh, opportunities that are opening up, but maybe in terms of markets, products uh, that you're hearing from your members or your own firms. Um, and um, and that'll, that'll feed into um, maybe your outlook also for uh, for the next six months as well. Uh, Ashik, maybe you want to go go first, uh, since you've already touched on some of the opportunities as well. Absolutely. I mean, for us, it's uh, the increase in demand, uh, but it's just not export demand, uh, Shiran. It's also a lot of interest on FDI part as well, um, especially um, India, which is the biggest producer of uh, ITBPM services. Uh, they are going through very similar challenges in terms of talent. Uh, you know, most of these talent have predominantly worked with US clients, et cetera, and all directly working, uh, especially the mid-tier companies, they are heavily infect, uh, affected. And um, we, as a chamber, we get on to calls every three, four, uh, three, four times a week, uh, you know, either having one-on-one -on -one calls with Indian companies uh, or with trade chambers, state trade chambers in India who are looking, exploring Sri Lanka as a, a India plus one kind of destination. Um, uh, so there's a lot of, they, because our attrition numbers, which we have published are about a year old, and it seems to be uh, uh, very attractive to the Indian market. A lot of people are uh, uh, coming here inquiring, but we've been very forthright in saying, not to discourage them, but the challenges are coming here as well. Uh, so if they're just trying to uh, you know, offset the challenges they are having back home, uh, it's not going to be uh, uh, easy here as well. Uh, they need to build that talent pipeline and look at strategies uh, how to uh, uh, operationalize their business here once they come. Uh, there's a lot of uh, investment opportunities also happening in our sector. Uh, you would have seen 99X uh, recently got a $20 million investment. Just two weeks ago, uh, WSO2 got uh, $90 million from Goldman Sachs. Um, uh, Senid is looking at an IPO. So there are a lot of investment activity is also coming because it's a, seen to be a very high growth, high yield sector. Um, and uh, these are some of the emerging or uh, emerging demands that are happening uh, in the industry. Uh, certain policies need to be uh, uh, looked at uh, to you know, really uh, capture this uh, opportunity because uh, some of these money, investment money is coming here not because Sri Lanka has a, a domestic large consumption market, it's not. Uh, they're looking at these companies because they have global potentials, uh, which means money that come in here need to be reinvested in global expansions for these companies. Uh, so we need to look at some of the uh, inhibiting factors around uh, forex regulations, uh, how to enable that money coming in here. Otherwise, some of these companies will end up, you know, uh, incorporating their subsidiary offices in other countries and channeling the investment money there uh, in order to facilitate their global expansion. And that will be a, a loss for Sri Lanka. Thanks, Ashik. 
um, Shia, in terms of any specific um, opportunities, markets that are really opening up uh, something very different to what you saw prior to the pandemic? So, you know, if you take the food industry, as I mentioned earlier, that there is, there is demand and also the, the opportunity really is there is demand for, for um, categories that can, you know, be grown um, from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has the opportunity to value add. We've, when we look at, you know, if, if you take our traditional industries of, of tea and, and coconut, uh, that, that's, coconut could be, a very big industry for us. But like tea, you know, we, we need to look at new trends and, and do innovation and value add and, and investment. Um, and, and likewise, it, right across different supply chains, we, we have the same opportunity um, in the food industry. Um, new markets are also opening up, um, I, I believe. Um, and uh, Sri Lanka stands poised well if we can have stability and, and pricing. One of the biggest challenges to, to meet th this opportunity is consistency. Consist consistency and also um, competitiveness. I don't see why we can't be competitive, but we, we need focus um, and we need policy makers to, to make it happen because there are various reasons why we are not competitive as well. So, thanks, yeah. thanks, Shia. Yeah. Uh, Chandi, brief. Any new um, markets opening up? Any new opportunities? Really, uh, that uh, we can talk about. Sure, and I'll keep it quick. Um, as an association, we are driving our three foot strategy, uh, which is the promotion of mango, pineapple, and banana. We feel like we feel that these items have a big potential in the fresh market and also for value addition. Um, and we are in the, in the process of um, so, sort of fleshing out this strategy. We presented it to various ministries and also the EDB as well. Um, but we are, in addition to these items, we also see potential for has avocado, jackfruit, coconut products, as uh, Shia said, uh, and also Moringa. Um, so we'll be promoting these uh, items through uh, as an association and also as, uh, as a company because we see potential in the Far East, EU and Middle Eastern markets for these items. Thanks. Uh, Tala, anything from uh, your members and associations? Um, I can actually uh, talk for on behalf of the rubber trade because uh, that's that's the business I'm in. Um, I think like Ashik said, uh, Shiran, we should look at um, uh, posing ourselves as India plus one. Um, you know, India has enough demand for, for natural rubber. Um, and if you look at uh, a model like what Malaysia, ha uh, Malaysia has, Malaysia actually imports uh, natural rubber because they have an export market in a ready export market in China. We should look at poising ourselves for India and Pakistan and the region um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a natural rubber supplier. Um, that's, uh, that's one thing. And uh, I think the next thing is uh, if I couple the fourth item, which is the outlook and what we'd like to look at in the next uh, barometer, uh, even the FTAs and the bilaterals um, if we could uh, get, I mean, uh, I don't think we've, we've covered it in this barometer, but the next time around, we, we should look at uh, if SMEs uh, could uh, benefit from getting more information about FTAs that, that are currently available. Thanks. Thanks, Talal. I think useful uh, pointers for us to consider. Um, Johan, any um, new markets? I know Europe um, US are the key markets and that's been growing this year. Um, beyond that, any any other? Con I mean, yeah, so I, 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 I think apparels tended, you know, one of the issues in the sector is we have our, we, we have our markets and we've always struggled to grow into new markets. But there is a couple of things that I think we need to be looking at. Um, in India, we have the um, ISFTA, which has this limit of 8 million pieces, and we've been lobbying to get that in, in um, that, that limit increased. Um, obviously, very keen to see what developments there are in China because, in terms of an FTA, because a number of our blood, of our brands sell in China, and obviously, if we could export directly from Sri Lanka to China with a with a benefit, that would be that would be useful to grow. And then I think the other two things are really in terms of the GSP plus scheme, which comes to an end in 2023. So, making sure that 
were on the ball with the EU in terms of our negotiations there, and also similarly in the UK, because obviously the UK is developing its own uh, UK GSP program. So I think those are the four uh, things that we would be looking at in terms of trying to help the sector grow. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joanne. Any, um, and in terms of the last section, I think some of you did cover the outlook and gave a few suggestions. Any final uh, remarks you feel in terms of the outlook, uh, particularly heading into 2020, uh, since we're on the cusp of um, uh, 2022 as well? And any suggestions that uh, the barometer survey should really focus on or have a very specific maybe section on um, going forward that will be very useful insights for us to uh, take in? Uh, as well. Um, Ashik, I see your hand up. Um, yeah. There are a couple of things, uh, uh, one is on this, uh, what Johan touched upon, is also the freelance movement is set to grow, and that will bring a lot of economic prosperity, especially in the, the region, rural areas. Um, as you know, our youth uh, can you know, start uh, you know, being empowered to do the entrepreneurial part of it themselves. Uh, they could do this while they are studying for a university graduate degree. Uh, the only inhibiting factor right now is uh, the whole payment uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, I know the policyholders are working at the very highest level uh, from the central bank to the ministries, uh, but it seems like a, a very regional uh, a roadblock that we have. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, that will uh, resolve itself sooner than later. Uh, the other part we would like to also see is, uh, especially in our sector, uh, we would like to see more women participation. BPM sector has almost 51% uh, women, 49% men, but in the IT sector, it's 35 to uh, 65. Uh, and our sector is something that can enable more women participation. Uh, some pointed questions around how much women participation and what the trend is. Uh, especially, we have a program called Returnship, which means people who have actually worked who have left because of you know taking care of their families, children, etc. But now they don't need to physically come back into work. They could even do uh, flexi hours, uh, part time work, uh, and still be very productive. And for the industry also, it's an additional workforce, especially in the current uh, supply constrained environment. And these people are people who left with experience. Uh, so you know them coming back into the workforce will be a, a very big economic benefit both for the industry and for the country. Thanks, Rashik. I see Shia, Johan, and Shaheen, these hands up. Uh, you have 30 seconds each. Uh, right. So um, I, I think um, I, I think uh, we um, need to, if we are very you know, serious about exports, um, Johan mentioned GSP. I, I think this is critical um, for the country um, to do the exports that we're doing now. And I think Definitely, there has to be more focus from government and interaction with private sector to, to make sure that we are all on track um, to do this. I did have another point, which is crossed my, just slipped my mind. I, I will get back to it. Thank you. You are? Um, yeah, I think in terms of what we look should be looking to do next to the barometer, um, Sharon, I think one of, the, one of the things that would be useful, you know, we're in this rapidly changing world in terms of domestic rules, regulations, changes, and so on. So I, I think something around, you know, you know, hopefully in six months time, things would have settled back down. And I'm not quite sure how you would um, cage it, whether it's sort of ease of doing business, but something around the local environment in which exporters are operating. Because as I say, with the current uh, challenges that we face, particularly over imports, over exchange control issues and so on. I think it would be useful to just keep an eye on that because that's an ever, that's a changing animal. And I think we, you know, in six months time, we might find that there's new challenges that have been come on. You know, as I said, you know, uh, some industries are having difficulty getting in raw materials and so on. So I think that maybe in terms of the focus of where we want to look at next, apart from the other things, something around the local working environment or something like that. I think that would be useful. Great. Well, thanks, Johan. Uh, Chayindi, very quickly. Yeah, very quickly. Um, I, I have some suggestions, but in terms of the implementation, implementation, I'll let you do the thinking. One is accountability. Uh, it's, it's quite important this, in this day and age. Maybe you could look at how much of the budget is actually implemented, 
um, how much of the budget uh, proposals are affecting the exporter. For example, the two and a half percent turnover tax is going to be absorbed by the exporter, uh, whereas for local companies, it's uh, you can, I, I suppose, pass it on. Um, and data availability and transparency, Shri Rani, you must be knowing Verita is doing a huge amount of work on this front. I want to see the Chamber of Commerce also driving um, uh, their way through this, uh, these issues as well. Uh, those were, and also as she initially mentioned, I want to see this um, uh, survey being more focused, more narrowed down into actionable areas. I want to see the EDB having um, their responsibilities, their sort of uh, requirement outlined. I want to see if it's a foreign ministry who's involved, then they need to be highlighted. Um, so I need I need to see uh, sort of accountability on that front as well. Thank you. Thanks, um, Andy. So if I just may, what, what I wanted to say earlier was I just got a brain freeze. Um, on the barometer itself, I, I think larger exporters and smaller exporters face very different um, challenges. So I think if, if we segregate that, and also category-wise, as, as some of the panelists said, um, it, it, the information will be a lot more meaningful. And really, we should be using this data to, to go forward, um, not, not something to just read. So that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thanks, Shia. Uh, so I think very, very useful insights uh, from everyone um, uh, on the panel and, and from Suresh, uh, useful for us to uh, consider brainstorm as we set forth the next uh, barometer. But beyond the barometer, I think a lot of crucial elements on policy making that was uh, discussed and hopefully uh, Suresh and the team uh, will take it uh, forward and definitely the chamber will also continue in its advocacy efforts. So let me thank uh, all the panelists for joining in and Suresh for continuing to be on, on, on the call as well. Uh, thank you so much. Um, let me now invite uh, Alki Ferreira, who is the Deputy Secretary General at the Salon Chamber to uh, deliver some closing remarks. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank you all on behalf of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce for joining the launch of the findings report of the first export barometer survey. We are thankful to USAID partner activity for collaborating with CCC for the implementation of this biannual survey, which provides export insights on the impact of COVID-19 and transition to a new normal. As mentioned before, this survey helps us identify business challenges, emerging trends, exporter confidence, impact of business facilitation measures, new requirements, and business strategies for recovery from COVID-19. For those who joined us late, we had over 120 exporters consisting of large firms, SMEs, as well as women-led and owned businesses taking part in this inception survey, sharing their insights to identify needs and support requirements for exporters. We are very thankful to our exporters for spending their valuable time and sharing export insights with us, enabling us to identify key export facilitation measures that needs to be implemented for driving Sri Lankan exports during these challenging times. CCC as the premier trade chamber in Sri Lanka will ensure that the exporter feedback will be utilized for advocating the implementation of targeted export facilitation measures. Further exporter input will also provide us with information that can act forward-looking indicators that signal changes in export trade. Such information gathered over time through implementation of this biannual survey would act as a very strong set of time series data that we could use for forecasting export trends. Uh, we will also take note of the suggestions made during this discussion for the next survey when drafting the questions and the different categories, etc. Finally, we appeal to you to continue to be a part of this biannual survey going forward and help us create effective information tools that can be utilized for making strategic interventions for improving trade facilitation 
and accelerating results in Sri Lanka's export growth. Once again, thank you for joining us for this first launch and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Aliki. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll bring this launch to a close, uh, slightly about 12 noon, but thank you for all the participants for sticking on and uh, we'll hope to see you in the next uh, barometer survey report uh, findings as well. There'll be a brief survey that will be sent as well uh, that will maybe get more insights from uh, the participants who joined in. Please take your time to fill this as well. Thank you so much. Have a great uh, day ahead. Thank you, Shiran. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Thank Shiran. Thanks. Bye -bye.